Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, super excited to dive into this week's episode. We've got a great segment planned for you guys, highlighting different types of insurance later in the program. But before we do that, we thought we'd go ahead and dive into our takeaways from the episode that we did with Lisa Duke. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing quite well. Summer has arrived here in Richmond. I know we have our summer swim season going and just spending a lot of time at the pool. So yeah, it's been, been fun. What's going on in your world? Well, probably the biggest thing is we are acclimating to our new neighborhood and our new move. And one of the things that has been just this unexpected gift is this immediate sense of community. Obviously, we, I mean, unabashedly, if that's a word, (laughs) we moved to this area to be closer to you and Laura, right? To have build community here with you guys. But our actual neighborhood is not the same as your neighborhood. We're about a mile and a half away. And our neighbors are incredible. Within five days, Everyone in our court has come over to our house and introduced themselves. And specifically, one couple and their two kids walked over, brought us baked goods, introduced themselves by name, and set the bar so high for like, this is a community, and we're excited that you guys are here. And I say that to say that I lived in my other neighborhood for five years. I met a total of three neighbors, you know, basically on my block. And at the end of the day, community has to start with you, right? What are you willing to put out? And I certainly remember other people moving to that neighborhood I never went across the street. I never brought someone baked goods. I never took my family to the door and said, welcome to the neighborhood. We're excited that you're here and we're excited to get to know you. And I realized that as much as me and you talk about community on the show, what steps have I actually taken to advocate for that for my family and for my neighborhood? It set the bar really, really high. And it was one of those truth moments. Yeah, I hear you. Like we always say, you have to take action, right? You have to get up off the couch. This is quite literally get up yeah. off the couch, yeah. walk your walk yourselves across the street and say hello. It was funny because actually I was here, I think last Wednesday doing a workout and one of your neighbors came across the street and he was just the coolest guy. It was, it was awesome. That's probably someone you're going to be friends with now. And I'm thinking to my own neighborhood where I have lived there at our new house for a little more than a year now. I think we're like 16 or 17 months in. And there are still people who I just wave to from across the street, and I've literally never spoken with them. What if your action step this week was quite literally, I mean this, I mean, you and Laura, you make something, banana bread, you could make banana bread. You could use those brown bananas, Brad. (laughs) (laughs) And you walk to their house and you ring the doorbell and you say, hi, I realize that we have been here for a year and we haven't met yet. And I really want to do more than just wave. So we brought you this loaf and we're excited to be here. What's your name? Yeah, Yeah, Jonathan, that's certainly a very interesting challenge. I, I will try my best, honestly, and I will report back. And a lot of this stuff is cultural, just neighborhood by neighborhood. I wonder if your neighborhood, maybe there was that one or two families who went outside of their comfort zone at the beginning and welcomed everyone else. And now it's almost like pay it forward because I didn't really see that in certainly in my prior house and in this new house just a little bit. But man, I mean, I saw it personally when I was here, the one neighbor like waved hello to me as if I lived here. The other neighbor came over and started a conversation. It was, I mean, that's really cool. There's this quote, like there is no they, right? There's just you. And what if every interaction on my neighborhood is a result of one individual quite literally one individual taking a baked good to someone else's house. And there's this trickle down effect. Well, we don't do that. Nobody does that in my neighborhood. Yes, because nobody's doing it. What if one person did? And so like I asked you that question, but quite literally last year, I would not have done this. I would not have considered this, but now that bar on forming community is so high because of these honestly courageous individuals to go over to a stranger's house with this baked good and an introduction. Hi, here we are. It's nice to meet you. Welcome. It's scary. 
right? It's scary. It's kind of like being in the elevator, you know, in, in the United States in particular, elevator culture is probably one of the most laughable things in existence. We quite literally go into the elevator and find a corner to stare at for 10 floors until we leave. <laughs> yeah, this is like your white whale. I swear you're going to conquer this eventually. <laughs> I, I notice it every single time. I'm just laughing. I'm waiting for someone to do something different. And I have. I have quite literally confronted this. But to go into an elevator and actually make eye contact and say, hi, how is your day going? Doesn't happen ever, ever. It just doesn't exist. And I was on a, a medical missions trip probably about five or six years ago. And we went to Guatemala. On that trip, I was also in an elevator. And I realized that everybody without fail said buenas. Every, across, it was the strangest thing. And I loved it. At the same time, I realized that this never happens inside the United States. This is something that we just do. We know that when we go in an elevator, we're just supposed to find a corner to stare at until we hit our floor and then we walk awkwardly away. Isn't there just this, maybe this, even this little bit of a trickle down effect that the more self-sufficient we get, the more we've removed our need to rely on other individuals, the less we feel the need to even interact with them. And what loss is that actually causing to our family dynamics, to our interpersonal dynamics, to our society at a macro level, because we don't need anybody. Yeah. And Jonathan, I think if you look back at the history of our show and maybe of the entire Phi movement, it started with numbers, right? It was all about the numbers. How do you hit that number? What is the precise number? And there's been a real significant shift. I mean, especially here on Choose a Fi, we talk about what will make us have a happier life. And a lot of it comes down to identity, purpose, connection. Connection is so huge. This is something that we have hit on. It's why we set up our Choose a Fi local groups. It's why we spend so much time thinking about how to make those better communities, right? We've talked about even just local things like tool co-ops or my mosquito fogger that I share or sharing books or, or things like this, right? Like how do you make it a better community where you see people, you interact with them, you're also saving money in the process, but most of all, you're focused on your happiness. And really for me, the biggest shift in my entire life in the last five years is how much spending time with other people impacts my happiness in the most positive manner. It, it has been the revelation of my life. And yeah, I mean, that is why we talk about it so often here on Choose a Vine. And Lisa had this quote in the episode. She said, no matter how much money we made, how much we spent, it didn't really bring us much lasting pleasure. We are sort of on that hedonic treadmill of you buy something, it feels great, then the excitement goes away and the bills associated with that thing never do. We were trying to buy our way to happiness. This is an interesting point, and I think it's one that comes back to we always highlight value here. And this isn't a word that we were using on day one. It was kind of our options were, are you frugal or are you cheap? And how do you tease out the difference between the two? And you were helped by uh, several listeners of our community that were talking about this framework, and it, it really resonated with you. But I think even that comes down to what is it that you actually value? And if you can, if you think, quote unquote, that you can afford everything, it's, it's really hard, or at least you can afford the payments. It's really hard to actually start to pin that down. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about, about purchases and lasting pleasure and also just taking a step back and saying, what actually do you derive happiness from in life? I think so many of us for decades go through life on that hamster wheel. It's easy to kind of dull our pain with purchases from the tiny little one, day-to-day -day ones, to expensive cars and houses and things like this, and not actually have that space to take a step back and say, is this what I want out of my life? And I think Phi provides that, and it's both obviously a positive thing, clearly, but there are some aspects where you're going to be confronted with things that you've never faced before. You've never had to take that time to stop and say, what makes me happy? What do I want out of life? And Jonathan, this reminds me of, of Taylor from the Playing With Fire movie. I think anybody who watches that movie knows she is the star of the movie. It is truly a journey for, for both Scott and Taylor, obviously, but Taylor specifically of going from this life that, that seemed to all outward appearances like this amazing life. And she described herself as extraordinarily happy. But yet on the path to Phi, she had this time where it was really difficult and she was not happy at all. It's odd when you first look at that and say like, is Phi leading to her un unhappiness? And, and to me, the answer is obviously no, it's not at all. It's just that she finally had that space to say, 
wow, I don't have to do what everybody else is doing in life. I'm not just dulling this with expensive purchases. What do I want out of life? What do I want the next 70 years of my life to look like? And, and that is not an easy process for everyone. I love that you highlighted Taylor's role in this movie. I agree with you. She is the driving force for this entire documentary. And more than that, if this documentary captures the imagination of the world, it will be because of her mindset transformation. I find myself in this situation frequently where I find an idea that I get super excited about and I just feel like I have to tell everybody, everybody about this. And most of the time, they look at me like I've gone crazy, that I've grown a third or fourth head. Uh, I think Scott also kind of felt, felt the same way when he took this idea, this concept of financial independence back to Taylor and to his family. That's what I think our community has always you know, struggled with. They, they get the idea, but how do you transfer that realization to a larger, more mainstream population? How do you bridge the divide? And I think in order to do that, you have to be where they are emotionally. You have to work through the components that, that they are dealing with. And I think a better representation of what people are actually dealing with is Taylor's mindset at the beginning of that movie. And you have this person that feels compelled to tell her about this idea that he thinks can radically transform their life. And she's resistant. She's like, um, but why? <laughs> why would we do this? Why would we, why would we embrace a more difficult situation? Why would we up, uproot ourselves from you know, this life that we've crafted? What you see throughout the documentary is her personal evolution of what it is that she actually values. And it's not always pretty. It's not always Instagram worthy. But after she's had the time to really evaluate where they were before, what the Instagram version of it looked like, but then what their life actually was. So how do you, what does that actually look like? Well, on Instagram, you have two brand new cars. You have a wonderful house. I mean, everybody knows that you've made it. Side by side, the reality is you live in one of the most expensive places in the country. Both of your cars are leased. You're making incredible income. You have nothing to show for it. You have a daughter that you want to spend time with. You have no time to spend with them. You're constantly stressed out about money. Both of those exist. And the world thinks that that's just okay, that it just is. The reality is once she saw that through the process of focusing on what it is that her and Scott valued, a lot of that had to go away. And that was like, well, why? But because she had this anchor, this list of things that she valued, by the end of this documentary, you can see that she had obtained that. Her time was now being reallocated to those things that she valued. And something had to go away in order for that to be possible. They had to make some choices. But by the end of this documentary, they're, they're thriving. I got a message from Joel. He sent me a private message on Facebook about this and basically said, guys, I really appreciated you talking about the need to go see this documentary with community. I got, I was an early backer. And I got a chance to watch this at home and I enjoyed it. But upon your suggestion, I went to the premiere and it was a whole nother experience. I, I don't know what it was about watching this documentary with community and realizing that this journey and, and, and in particular Taylor's journey, it resonated with me at a whole nother level when I was watching this with the community. I'm so glad that I went to the screening to actually see this. I think that what Taylor represents for us is really an opportunity to get a dialogue started if we can get people to take to take their eyes off the Instagram Pinterest perfect life profile and instead start with a, a, a piece of paper with 10 questions on it, what is it that you value? From there, we can use the simple math. We talked about how the show was based on math. We can use the math to help build that, right? The math is incredibly useful, but we have to, first of all, actually be able to separate out the marketing and actually allow us to have a real conversation about what do we want our life to look like. All right, guys, so real quick before we move on, let me just insert this here that there are grassroots screenings starting all over the country for this documentary where you can see it. There are a few premiere events happening around the country where cast and crew are going to be coming and setting up a special event. There are four cities still that are getting one of these premiere events, Atlanta, Detroit, Richmond, and New York City. Atlanta is on June 29th. There are still some tickets available. I'm setting up a short code for you guys. If you're hearing this, just because the podcast is an easy way for me to announce the tickets and have you find the link in a very easy manner. If you want to go to choosefi.com slash ATL, choosefi.com slash ATL, it'll take you to the link where you can pick up those tickets and we'll be announcing the other screenings um, as they get a little bit closer. 
at the end of this episode, after we finish the extra, I'm also going to be going through screenings that have their ticket deadlines coming up in the near future. I'm just going to be putting that as a addendum on the end of each episode for the next several weeks. I want to make sure that if you're wondering if there's a screening in your area, maybe you're not in a local group or for whatever reason, even though you are in the local group, you haven't heard about it yet. I want to give you guys a running update. So if you stay tuned after the show, then I will let you know each week for the next several weeks, which screenings are about to hit their uh, deadline to, to sell their tickets to make that grassroots screening happen. So we'll just keep that going every week for the next few weeks. So Brad, I, what I love is the compare and contrast between the theme of this documentary and this past week's episode with Lisa Duke. Yeah, and this reminds me of what Lisa said in the podcast, which was we were trying to buy our way to happiness. And she said, I don't know what the point of all this is. And now after they've made these moves, they got rid of the fancy house, the SUV that they had for one time a year to take the dog to the vet, which is hilarious, <laughs> right? The heated steering wheel on the truck. I mean, all these things. She said, our life is so much simpler now. They say the things that you own, own you. And the less you have, the less you have to pay for, the less you have to maintain. It was a process of simplification for us. That really encapsulates what we're talking about here. It is that going back to basics. It's not about deprivation. We're not depriving ourselves here. We're not living lives of being misers or anything insane like that. It's, it's just simplifying. It's finding out what do you enjoy about life. And I, I'm thinking about my own Father's Day just this past weekend. My family and I, we played, I think, maybe four hours of board games, Jonathan. And we went to the pool and we swam for a couple hours. We had just low-key food cooked at home, nothing extravagant. But that was about the best day I could imagine. It was not because it required hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go out to this fancy restaurant or drink these uber-expensive beers or anything like that. It was, it was none of that. It was just spending time with my family doing stuff that we love. To me, that's something I've figured out. That means more to me than just about anything in life. So my challenge to you, the audience, is take a look at your life. Find out what are those things that really, truly, at your core, light you up. And try to find a way to weave them into the fabric of your life on a daily or weekly basis. All right, Brad, well, let's go ahead and switch gears. And I want to highlight some shout outs from the community. And the first one I want to mention, actually, it's a personal frugal win of the week. Hashtag FWOTW. <laughs> it's, it's growing in popularity. <laughs> <laughs> you and you've taught your son now, I think. Yes, he, he is aware. <laughs> well, actually, my frugal win of the week is we went to the library to go get some specific books that I have been enjoying reading to him. And the library was actually having a book sale, you know, all books, 50 cents. And by the way, the library in this area is unreal. I mean, it is so incredible. But uh, the exact books that I was going in to get for him were a part of this 50 cent book sale. And we snagged two books for a dollar, man. Uh, so that was our frugal one of the week. But we want to go ahead and give some shout outs to other people in our community. And Kelly actually shared this one from her daughter, where her daughter was actually playing violin outside the stadium. Yeah, this was awesome. I saw this this morning and I just knew we had to mention it on the podcast. She said, playing at the stadium. Well, mom, I need to practice either way. I might as well make money. She's <laughs> eight and she has a side hustle game. <laughs> I think this was at uh, the Brewers Stadium. I mean, this is at like a legit MLB baseball stadium. And she, here she is standing out playing the violin. She's got her music stand and music. And yeah, she's practicing and trying a side hustle at the same time. I mean, how cool is that? Juan in that same comment thread said, get that child a Roth IRA. And <laughs> Kelly responded. She says she actually has the IRA as a co-author and a UTMA account. Man, wow. this kid is on the path. <laughs> I got another shout out that we want to give to Naomi, who actually let us know that she just got her Southwest Companion Pass. Oh, that's awesome. She said, thank you to this group for making me aware of this. I'm so happy and grateful. My husband and I want to use this to visit as many national parks as we can and for a trip to Hawaii. I'll document all the trips. And she had a question at the end of that, Brad, which I'd like to direct to you. She says, any tips on how to further save on national parks? We already have the park pass or Hawaii trips. Yeah, so this is actually perfect timing because I am going to Hawaii this August with my family. And actually we, Jonathan, I didn't even tell you this, but we just booked our spring break trip for 2020. 
and we're going to kind of the uh, Phoenix, Sedona area of Arizona. We're going up to the Grand Canyon, which should be awesome. Wow. So yeah, I mean, we have this whole plan already set. I mean, I've got my tickets booked with points. We wound up using a bunch of mostly Marriott points. I actually used some Hyatt and Marriott points to book all of the nights, except when we we're staying by the Grand Canyon. And, and basically, that's because there are no major chain hotels right there at the entrance. So there are a bunch of hotels. And what I was able to do was use a Capital One Venture card. So I just simply paid for that, that travel expense. In this case, it was a hotel with my Capital One Venture card. And after the fact, I'm able to just log into my Venture account, use their purchase eraser, as they call it, and wipe out that expense. So that was a really easy way to get a hotel that just simply doesn't cost all that much. I mean, this is not like a $500 a night uh, Ritz Carlton or something like that. It's just the hotel near the Grand Canyon. And if you find a good deal, those points actually go a longer way. So it's it's really, really valuable. That's why I love a card like that. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a second and highlight this. And uh, Brad, did you ever uh, watch that show, uh, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? <laughs> <laughs> not, not only did I watch it, I think I went to a taping of it in no! New York City when I was in like fifth grade. I did not know you were going to say that. That's so much better now. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about Oregon Trail next time. <laughs> All right, so what I thought we could do, you know how in that show they would have like dossiers of like the different characters involved? Yeah. Uh, I thought what we could do is a card dossier, right? And and the reason the impetus for this is we have just released our free travel course, which you can find at chooseify.com slash travel. And I thought periodically as it fits, we could talk about certain cards that I think would be valuable for our community. To our community, if you want to get all of this information in a very linear fashion, of course, you should just go to chooseify.com slash travel. This course is there for you to really help build on itself. So you have a fundamental understanding of how all these cards work together. But today, what I thought we could do, since you just mentioned it, is do the dossier of the Capital One Venture card. All right, so here it is, the Capital One Venture. One of the cards we've always liked is the Capital One Venture. It's one of our favorite ways to erase travel expenses where points and miles couldn't be used. Now, Brad, I know you had in the past talked about Disney. Uh, these would be things like tickets to Disney through undercover tourist or airlines or hotels where you don't have miles or points saved up or where it's a peak travel period and a free award redemption is just not possible. Now, in a pinch, you could even pay for a travel expense before you've completely earned your bonus, then redeem it later after your trip, after the bonus has landed in your account. A great perk on this is that you earn an unlimited two points per dollar spent, but that earning rate gets a huge bump to 10 points per dollar if you book your accommodations on Hotels.com. When you pair that with Hotels.com's one night free after staying 10 nights, you're actually going to get a lot of value here, especially if you do not have or choose not to have a big stash of points with any hotel loyalty program and prefer to remain a free agent. Other perks include up to $100 statement credit every four years if you use the card to apply for the TSA pre-check or global entry. Uh, Ed actually did the research for us, and the global entry would be a better value, although there's a couple additional moving parts for that one. And being able to transfer your Capital One Venture Miles to family and friends, making it easier to actually pull your points together for those big international redemptions. Now, all of those are great perks in and of themselves. But in the last year, Capital One Venture added another feature that I think makes this card one of our top three cards. Now, Ed talks about this in the course that I mentioned to you guys, that free travel course at choosefi.com slash travel. But you, basically, you can now transfer Capital One Venture points to a handful of airlines like Air Canada, Singapore Airlines, and you can use these foreign programs to redeem domestic flights on United. Now, United flights are ubiquitous in the United States, so I'm sure you see the appeal of that. As of now, when we're recording in June 2019, you can earn 50,000 bonus miles once you spend $3,000 on purchases within the first three months from account opening. Now, it's a total of 56,000 Capital One miles or $560 in travel expenses. Even better, there's a $0 intro fee followed by a $95 annual fee after the first year. If you like a card that gives you lots of flexibility and options, the Capital One Venture is a great option. So to our audience listening to this, we've partnered with Card Ratings for our coverage of credit cards. They are an affiliate of this program. And if you want to get started with your travel rewards journey and simultaneously want to support this show, just go to chooseify.com slash venture to start your travel rewards journey today. So a bunch of stuff in there, Brad. I'm hoping that over time we can kind of unroll a few of the cards that we get incredibly excited about. Obviously, to our audience, they can get a very thorough unpacking of all this information at chooseify.com slash travel. But tying this back to the conversation we started this with, your thoughts. 
Yeah, it's perfect timing. I think cards like Capital One Venture are ultra valuable, especially for people in the FI community who are very flexible and are looking for a deal, frankly, right? So this is not about finding some aspirational $2,000 a night hotel room and getting a free night and saying, I got quote unquote $2,000 worth of free value. That's not how we think that because I don't know about you guys, but I would never spend 2000 bucks a night on a hotel. It's 10% off. Would you have bought it if it would just cost 10% less? No, but it's 10% off. <laughs> it's got to be good. So for me, a card like Venture is really valuable in that because I'm flexible and because I'm looking for a deal, I can find hotel rooms very inexpensively and maybe get five or six free hotel nights out of one credit card sign up bonus. I mean, that is really, really nice. It's also nice, like Jonathan, you mentioned, Undercover Tourist is a way that I've personally found a workaround to buy Walt Disney World tickets and use them as a redemption. There had previously been no way to get Disney World tickets for free using travel rewards points. That was something I researched in depth and determined that it really does work. So it's cool to find these ways that anything that's coded as a travel expense for your credit card can be wiped out using the card like Venture. And Jonathan, I can't miss this opportunity to rib you about TSA PreCheck. I know we, we've we been traveling a bit, right? For uh, <laughs> We went to San Diego for the Playing With Fire premiere, and I just waltzed through, waltzed through security. <laughs> and there you are at the back of like an hour-long line. And I mean, TSA PreCheck is phenomenal. So I mean, that just as a life hack, it's somewhere in the vicinity of 100 bucks, and it's good for five years. So just in general, I would get that because it's only $20 a year. You just whisk through security. Global entry is amazing to have. I'm literally, as you're like <laughs> ribbing me about this, <laughs> putting, putting it on my to-do list. Nice, Don't nice. not have that. Because <laughs> we're doing a lot more flights lately just with everything that's going on. And um, yeah, every time you just waltz on through. And that's literally what he does. Dang it, I said literally twice now in this episode. I'm gonna roll with it though. That is what he does. He actually has a smile on his face as he leaves me at the back of a one hour line to go through this pre-check. <laughs> I'm like, Brad, I'm getting there. I'm getting there an hour early. He says, why? Oh yeah, that's right. I know. <laughs> oh yeah, man. It's great. So anyway, we highly recommend the venture card. So yeah, choose vita.com slash venture, or as Jonathan said, choose vita.com slash travel to sign up for our free travel rewards course. All right, guys, for this next segment, we wanted to take a macro look at insurance. So we reached out to Policy Genius, who we are an affiliate with and have been working with for the past year. They are an insurance compare and contrast platform that specializes in all different types of insurance, but in particular life insurance. We're going to be speaking with Jennifer Fitzgerald, who is their CEO and co-founder today. And we asked her to help us build a framework for the different types of insurance that you should consider over your lifetime and really help us get past the 101 and think about this from an optimization perspective. And with that, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I kind of did this setup, you know, insurance over your over your lifetime. That's a pretty uh, ambitious setup for an interview. I know there's a lot of different types of insurance, but this is something that you have been working with for several years and maybe even a decade at this point. And I'm curious if you wanted to kind of help our audience build a framework for how to think about insurance, where would you even start with that conversation? Sure. So the way to think about insurance is to think about it as your safety net or your protection. It is the thing that you hope to never use in most cases, but if the worst happens or a bad case scenario happens, you're going to be happy that you have it. So that's kind of the the mindset and the framework to think about it. And I think your setup of thinking about insurance over your whole life is the right way to do it because your insurance needs are, are going to change over time as your financial situation changes and as your personal situation changes. So that's exactly the the right framework to think about it. Jennifer, in general terms, what would be the first type of insurance that someone is going to approach in their lifetime? The first type of insurance that you're probably going to approach, let's say that you are graduating from college and you are now moving into the working world. The big 800-pound gorilla in the insurance world when it comes to your personal finances is health insurance. So that's probably the big thing that you're first going to encounter. If you get a nine-to-five office job that provides employee benefits, chances are your employer is going to offer health insurance. There's probably going to be decisions that you have to make with respect to your health insurance. Do you go high deductible, low deductible? What's a PPO? What's an EPO? But the baseline case is just have it. So we have a lot of people say, do I even need to have it? It's expensive to have uh, in terms of the premium and not having 
health insurance is probably the the sh- most surefire way to end up in bankruptcy. You know, I don't think we could spend the duration of the show talking about healthcare. I, I love how you kind of called it the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I think that yeah. is probably downplaying, you know, how, how important and how big of a piece of the puzzle it actually is. And it's very nuanced, right? Depending on whether or not you're employed, self-employed, your particular situation, uh, the numbers are going to be all over the map. So, you know, I'm certainly glad that we covered that. Let's go ahead and move to maybe a couple other pieces of the puzzle. And in particular, I'm thinking about auto insurance and life insurance. Correct. So uh, moving on from health insurance, if you have a car and most Americans will at some point earlier in their working career, auto insurance is key. The thing for auto insurance is that the rates are going to depend on a lot of factors, some of which you don't necessarily uh, have insight into, right? So auto insurance companies are going to look at your driving history. They'll look at your age. They'll look at the miles that you drive. They'll look at your credit history. They'll look at a lot of things to figure out what kind of risk are you and what's the likelihood that you're going to make a claim on a policy. So our rule of advice is to make sure that you have obviously one, be a safe driver (laughs) and pay attention to those things. And then two is make sure that you are revisiting your auto insurance policy at least once a year because rates do change. Different insurance companies will have different periods that they look back on accident history. You get older. Generally, as you get older, you get to be classified as a safer driver unless your driving history indicates otherwise. So to make sure that you're getting the most competitive rate and making sure that you have the best possible coverage, you should probably revisit your coverage uh, at least least once a year with an independent agent who can help you scan the market. Jennifer, I have a question about discounts on auto insurance. I, I hear that there, are, and, and this is probably based on just like total random anecdotes that I've heard, like there are ways to get some type of discounts if you are ex profession or you're involved in some organization. Is there any truth to that? And I guess probably more importantly, how would people go about finding any discounts that might be applicable to them? Yep. There are discounts when it comes to home and auto insurance, and you will typically find those through uh, a couple things. One is if you are a member of any professional association. So if you are a member of like the American Medical Association or American Bar Association, just to name a few off the top of my head, most professional associations may have a relationship with a home and auto insurance company. So check there. The second source is an alumni association. You can check through your college or university's Alumni Association to see if they have an affiliation there. There's also, you know, affinity groups of AARP or other associations may have discounts for your home and auto insurance. What I will tell you, though, is that just because a certain carrier offers you a discount doesn't mean that it's going to be the best rate. Their discounted rate could still be more expensive than the quote unquote normal rate you could get through a different insurance company. So again, the best way to figure out if you've got the best auto insurance coverage is to work with an independent agent or an independent platform, they will also know what discounts are available to you. So for example, they will know if uh, Liberty Mutual has alumni insurance discounts, or if you can get a safe driver discount here, or if this carrier is going to be more favorable to people who have two drivers on the policy. So it's a lot to navigate. And you certainly don't want to spend your time becoming an expert in all the nuances. So do your research, but find somebody that you trust who can advise you at least once a year, right? You should be doing a check on your home and auto coverage. Yeah, that's great advice. And and since we're kind of talking about the holistic picture here of, of insurance, I'm curious if there are like multiple policy discounts that you see, especially like in what types of different insurance, if if that is the case, and any other type of interplay there might be be between policies. I know with my homeowner's insurance, they required a certain, I think it was like an underlying limit on my auto insurance. Is there any validity to that? And, And can you speak to any type of interplay between the policies? Sure. So in terms of how your insurance policies work together, the most common and usual interplay is between your homeowner's insurance coverage, and that includes renter's insurance as well as your auto insurance. Everybody thinks about bundling and getting a discount for bundling. That applies to home and auto. So you will get a better rate from a specific carrier, for most carriers, in fact, if you combine your homeowner's insurance and your auto insurance coverage, because that allows them to underwrite you fully as a risk, both in terms of like property as well as liability. That's the typical kind of connection and bundling discount you're going to see. Very rarely are you going to see a discount for life insurance with uh, if your insurance company also offers auto or home insurance. It's just because they're 
very different policies that look at very different things in terms of pricing. So when you think about bundling, it's really home auto. And then you might also hear about umbrella insurance. Those are the three that typically go together. I want to come back to Umbrella, but I want to, before we do that, actually spend a little bit of time on life insurance and in particular, a little compare and contrast with term versus whole life insurance. Most people start thinking about life insurance when they have financial dependents or people to protect. So if you are, you know, 22, no student loans or no co-signed student loans, no family, no mortgage, you probably don't need life insurance. Where we see people enter the market for life insurance is, you know, they get married or they get a home with a mortgage on it or they have kids. When people start to depend on your income, that's when you're going to look at life insurance. For most people who need life insurance, they typically just need term life insurance. So the difference between term and whole or term and permanent and whole is a type of uh, permanent life insurance is that term life insurance is valid and with you for a specified amount of time. That's the term. It can be 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. But after that term is over, then you no longer have life insurance. So contrast that with permanent life insurance, of which whole is probably the most common type, is that is life insurance that you have for your entire life, as long as you keep paying the premiums on the policy. So the question is, well, why not just get permanent life insurance? Well, two things. One is it's a lot more expensive dollar for dollar uh, than term life insurance. And two, you actually probably don't need permanent life insurance because you only typically need life insurance to cover your obligations, right? So you'll need it until your children are adults, right? Because after they're adults, presumably they're not depending on you and wouldn't suffer financial hardship if you were to die. You typically only need term life insurance until your home's paid off because after your home's paid off, you don't have to worry about prematurely dying and then what's your family going to do about the mortgage? So the advice is typically you buy term insurance and then then you invest the rest. There are some people who do need permanent life insurance and those people fall into a couple of categories. One is if you have more complicated estate planning needs, wealthier people will typically look at permanent life insurance as a vehicle for like savings and tax deferment. Or the second, and what we uh, often see a lot of in our customer base is if, for example, you have a child uh, who is disabled or who, or who otherwise might need lifelong care, in which case, yeah, you probably would need some sort of permanent life insurance to make sure that child will have some financial resources even after after you've gone. Yeah, Jennifer, this brings up an interesting quandary just in my own life. And I guess I'm going to use this as an example for basically our audience, right, which is people either pursuing financial independence or who have reached that point of financial independence. And we have term life insurance policies. And in fact, I literally just wrote the check today for my wife's policy. And it's only a couple hundred dollars a year for $600,000 death benefit. But we've reached financial independence. So in theory, we really don't need this, but I've just reflexively been paying this every single year. And just in hearing you talk about it, that I had that light bulb aha moment like, hey, dummy, maybe you don't need this anymore. If it's truly used just to pay obligations, I am not sure that I that I necessarily need it. And I'd be curious if you have advice for me. Like, is it as simple as, hey, you probably don't need this anymore or are there additional considerations? The biggest consideration is your financial obligations. If there are any obligations that require you to be a breadwinner and earning an income, you probably still need life insurance. Now, what happens when there are people who are financially independent before retirement age, that raises a different set of questions, right? There are other uses for life insurance, like funding, I don't know, a charitable endowment or some other estate planning needs. But if somebody had life insurance purely just to protect their income up until retirement, to make sure that those obligations would be funded if they were to die prematurely, then yeah, that's a question that you should that you should ask and work through that scenario with your spouse. If and it's a very morbid conversation, but <laughs> these most good financial planning conversations often go to uncomfortable areas. So have that conversation uh, with I like your to spouse. stack morbid conversations on Friday. Makes for a fantastic <laughs> weekend. <laughs> Maybe just that, have it over like a glass of wine or something. <laughs> But play it out. Like if one of you were to die unexpectedly, what sort of financial impact would that have on the family? And if the answer is, 
well, I'm financially independent. I'm not earning an income that we rely on, right? That's just going into savings or whatever your situation is. But, you know, play out the scenario and walk it through. So you might decide that, you know what, we are the equivalent of retired and we are just drawing down on our assets. And so life insurance doesn't make sense. That was an amazing summary, and and I appreciate you taking the time there. I wanted to circle back to home insurance, and I think it kind of ties nicely just because there's your personal home, and then when it spills over and you have investment property. So in Brad's case, he was mentioning the fact that you know he may or may not need term insurance going into the future, depending on how this weekend conversation goes. Uh, (laughs) But aside from that, you know, as his assets become more complicated, so he has enough investments to cover his life for the rest of time, and on top of that, he has maybe rental properties. What other types of insurance should people be considering in homeowners insurance, umbrella insurance? What what else is out there? For the average American, their biggest financial asset is their home and any other real estate that they own. So having sufficient homeowners and liability coverage around those properties is absolutely important to protecting those financial assets. There's a lot of nuances around homeowners insurance, how much coverage you should have, you know, making sure that it's replacement cost value for the home. My advice here is similar to what I said on auto insurance is to find an independent agent or an independent platform that you're comfortable with and you trust that can help you scan the market at least once a year. And just as importantly, in terms of price, making sure that you have the right levels of coverage across your real estate properties. We deal with a lot of very financially savvy consumers on our platform, but I'm still surprised every day at how even very educated and financially savvy people don't really know if they've got the right levels of coverage in their homeowner's insurance policy, which is scary, right? Because that's going to be your biggest asset on your personal balance sheet. So find an expert that you trust who will make sure that you have the right level of coverage for your property value, the number of properties that you have, and your own level of personal assets, because that's one of the factors as well. And so, you know, there are going to be nuances. Some homeowners insurance companies won't insure rental properties unless they also have your primary residence as well with them. So again, there's a lot of complexity there. One thing that we talk about, because we get a lot of consumers for homeowners insurance who are landlords, who have rental properties, who are Airbnb hosts, one thing that we do stress for them is to make sure they have sufficient liability coverage because as soon as you're dealing with other people, be they tenants, be they Airbnb guests, there's going to be liability involved. And so making sure that you've got the right liability coverages on those policies and if necessary, having umbrella coverage as well. Umbrella is just excess liability over and above what's on your homeowner's renters or auto insurance policy. So typically it's recommended if you've got assets or net worth north of like a million dollars because there's going to be caps on liability coverage for your homeowners or your auto policy. So we typically in those cases will recommend umbrella liability coverage. And usually when you just tack it on to an existing homeowner's policy, it's pretty affordable. So it's like, you know, one or two extra hundred dollars a year for an extra one or two million dollars of coverage for for liability. So Jennifer, I I wanted to slow down again on kind of like the interplay between the policies. So let's say you have homeowner's insurance and then you want to get umbrella insurance. Are there those type of like liability limits that you need to have like a certain minimum threshold you need to have generally to get umbrella? Because otherwise... I'm thinking I would want the lowest possible limit on my my initial policy and then just have this umbrella for only 100 or 150 dollars a year per million there as a backstop. But I assume you can't do that. But but talk me through that. Yeah, because now that's what I would do as well. <laughs> you cannot do that. So insurance companies have thought <laughs> through all these long and hard. Yeah, through all these little ways to get around it. So typically when you get umbrella liability coverage, you usually can only get it through your insurance company that you have auto or homeowners insurance through, and they will require you to have a specified amount of liability coverage on your auto or homeowners policy. So this would just be covered on top and above that. I'm actually really interested in talking about this umbrella insurance a little bit farther, just because we had uh, Tanya from Our Next Life come on the show and she was making the case to us that one of the reasons that she wanted to get an umbrella policy, no matter what dollar amount it was, whether it be for 1 million, 2 million, 3, whatever, just get a policy for umbrella insurance because one of the additional benefits you get outside of the payout is just that the insurance company would then provide the legal defense because they don't want to pay out that extra amount. So you would kind of, along with the umbrella policy, really be getting a free legal team to protect that umbrella insurance policy. 
Yep, that's correct. Typically, I don't know if I would phrase it as a free legal team, but embedded in any insurance policy with liability coverage is going to be legal expenses because the insurance company will work to defend against any claims or litigate any claims that they think another insured owes to them. So basically, you know, we always, what's the complaint with insurance companies? It's always hard to get them to pay out. Now you have that working for you, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I actually wanted to ask about Umbrella as well because we were talking about having rental properties, let's say. So I actually just recently purchased my first few rental properties and they're single family rentals. And I went to Geico where I have my umbrella insurance policy and attempted to, you know, basically put them under this, this policy. But because I had purchased them in an LLC's name, they wouldn't allow me to do that. And I'm curious, do you see that often? And if so, how would you advise someone like me? Are there umbrella insurance, and there might be a different phrase for it, for a business entity like an LLC that's going to own a few properties? Yeah, it's going to be more complicated if you've got a business entity through which you're operating your you know, investment properties, at which case it probably would be easy for you to work with an insurance agent because they'll be able to advise you on what's commercial versus what's residential. And those lines change pretty regularly given what's happening in the broader economy. So you know, the pa- fact that people are now part-time landlords through Airbnb or part-time commercial drivers through Uber and Lyft. So that land landscape is changing pretty regularly. So my advice is, you know, rather than trying to learn it yourself and making the wrong, potentially wrong decision is to work with a trusted independent insurance agent who can help you figure out what's going to be personal coverages and what's going to be commercial coverages. This may have something to do with, you know, my training as a pharmacist, but I, one of the other lines of insurance that I wanted to talk about is disability insurance. And, and to me, what was interesting about that is I always feel like people that are in medicine, particularly physicians, doctors, I would always hear them talk about the need for disability insurance. And then I would almost hear nobody else discuss disability insurance at all. Outside of that little niche, I wouldn't really hear anybody discuss the need for it. And since we're talking to you about insurance, I would love for your perspective on who should be looking into disability insurance. Great question. And it's actually one of my favorite topics because it's probably the most misunderstood topic of insurance. So the shorter answer is anybody who depends on their paycheck needs disability insurance, full stop. So if you work for a living and you need that paycheck, full stop, you need long-term disability insurance, unless you can self-insure for a period of six months or greater without a paycheck because you are sick or you're injured and can't work. So if you can self-insure for six, 12, 24 months, you may not need disability insurance. So you're saying if you have a two-year emergency fund, you're probably going to be okay. Is that that like in summation what I just heard you say? You're probably going to be okay. Even then, if something catastrophic happens, some disability claims, you know, if it's cancer or something serious, could go for two, three, four years. So with disability insurance, this honestly is is a hole in my knowledge. I know essentially nothing about this. Like talk us through. Because you're not a doctor, Brad. Yeah, well, (laughs) (laughs) very cute, Jonathan. Uh, What should we be looking for when we're approaching disability insurance? So disability insurance, what it's called in the UK, for example, which is a better name for it, is income protection insurance. So what disability insurance is insurance that kicks in if you are too sick or injured and can't do your job. If you are, for example, diagnosed with cancer and you have to be out of work for six months to do chemotherapy and you know recover, disability insurance will kick in and replace your income while you are out getting treatment. If you are a doctor, for example, let's say you're a surgeon, you you mentioned why do doctors always talk about this? It's because doctors spend years and years and years and usually upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars to train for their profession. And so when they're finally actually in their profession and earning money, God forbid, if you're a surgeon and you break your hand and you can't perform surgery, guess what? You're not getting paid typically. So you need disability income to replace that paycheck if you break your hand or if you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and now you have, you know, hand tremors and you can't operate at all ever. So doctors are trained very early on and insurance agents typically talk to them about it during med school or residency that you are investing so many years of your life and so much money into this profession what happens if illness or injury prevents you from um, doing that profession? And honestly, that doesn't just apply to doctors. That applies to everybody. 
Brad's got a cold this week. He's watching his voice. Uh, no, <laughs> no, but really rewind that just for a second. Is there a, are there pitfalls? What's the market range for disability insurance? And is there a smarter way of doing it? For disability insurance, if you work at an employer that offers a full suite of benefits, usually there will be some sort of disability coverage. Typically, there will be short-term disability, and this is for truly short-term. So for, you know, you're out for a week or two with the flu, short-term is basically designed to cover conditions with the short-term duration, typically shorter than 90 days. After that, you know, if you've got something serious, right, so a very serious accident or trauma, a very serious illness diagnosis, typically after that, you would need long-term disability insurance. So, for example, we had an employee a couple of years ago who was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she was out of the office and getting treatment and recovering for probably eight months or so. And our company's long-term disability insurance coverage is what kicked in for her to make sure that she still had an income while she was getting treatment for breast cancer. Not all companies offer it. So what we advise people is whenever you get a new job, take a good look at your benefits package. And if you don't have disability insurance through your employer, you should get it otherwise. When you have long-term disability and then you have to actually take out that policy or use that policy. We talked about short-term being less than 90 days. Long-term, is that indefinite? Is that up to two years? Like what is timeline? What does long-term disability mean when you're actually drawing down on that? So it depends, long-term disability can, it depends on what type of policy you get and what the benefit period is. So you can get a long-term disability policy that will pay up to uh, five years. You can get a long-term disability policy that'll pay 10 years. You can get a long-term disability policy that'll pay you all the way through retirement. So if you are permanently disabled, it will pay benefits through retirement age. Is insurance, I guess this is really closely tied to the disability, and then you already kind of referenced this earlier, but I want to come back to it. Is insurance forever for all people, like the, the self-insure? Let, let's just explore that a little bit further. We have a community of people that are actively striving to save 50% of their income. This isn't like a debt-free community. This is a community of people that are getting to the point where working is optional. Do they need to have disability insurance until their 60s, until retirement, or is there like some threshold at which... You know, it's like, okay, this was important. This was a period of time where if something had gone wrong, it would have been devastating. But now, more or less, you can start having these conversations about, is it necessary? So for disability insurance, you need it as long as you're working. So if you retire at age 40, then you don't need it anymore. As long as you were actively working and earning a paycheck, and that paycheck is either funding retirement or paying bills or, you know, paying down debts, you should have disability insurance. So you say, so regardless of whether you retire, you say, I am now financially independent. If I never earn another dollar, I'll be good to go. Effectively for that person, you're also simultaneously saying, I don't need disability insurance. Right. And typically you can't keep carrying the policy because if you kept that policy, even after you're not working, then you don't have anything to claim, right? Because the claim would be, I'm no longer able to earn my regular income because of this illness or injury. So You need disability insurance while you're working. If you are no longer working and are permanently retired, then you don't need it. I think the last one that I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about is long-term care insurance, because I think the cost benefit analysis seems to be shifting. Like it's getting, it's becoming an increasingly more difficult case to make, even though this is probably the insurance that you are the most likely to need. It's getting so expensive. What are your thoughts on that? Actually, disability insurance is the insurance you're most likely to need. <laughs> okay. All right. I stand corrected. Yeah. Your odds of facing some sort of disability, and that's just something that keeps you out of work for a period of longer than three months, is much higher than either dying prematurely or needing you know, long-term care. So that is my, my last pound the table uh, PSA we'll for disability insurance. <laughs> we'll stop. <laughs> yeah. So for long-term care insurance, um, this has been a bit of a tricky product. What happened about 10 years ago is a lot of the insurance companies realized that they underpriced these and they got two things wrong. One was people were claiming on these more frequently than they had predicted. And then two people were living longer than they had predicted. And the third thing is that the cost of nursing home care and medical costs for the elderly was skyrocketing faster than they predicted. So the price on long-term care policies is a moving target. The rules are changing pretty frequently with respect to what's covered by state Medicaid versus long-term care. However, this is the thing that I think keeps a lot of people up at night is what happens if I outlive my savings, what happens if my parents need care and now I have to care for my parents as well as my children. So 
this is absolutely a conversation to have with your family, with your aging parents, and with an advisor who knows long-term care. Because again, the pricing and the product features is something that has changed pretty dramatically over the last few years. So my advice is don't go into this unassisted. Jennifer, CEO and co-founder of Policy Genius, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing really a, a macro level to the types of insurance that our community should be considering. Thank you for having me. Always uh, happy to talk about insurance. So Brad, I really loved how Jennifer was able to take a look at these different line items at a macro level and help us build a framework. What's interesting to me is when you think about insurance, you can kind of think like this nebulous, it's ununderstandable. It's, it's, it's too complex. You can't handle it. Just hopefully everything works out. But I think what we've been trying to do, we crave simplicity, right? We're trying to bake simplicity. And if we can just do a little bit of research, we can find the tools and the insurance products that you actually need, get those taken care of, and then just kind of maybe not set and forget, right? Because she said you always want to stay up to date, but at least kind of have a basic understanding of what's out there because knowledge is power and power prevents you getting scammed or suckered by a product that really doesn't serve you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And yeah, a bunch of little takeaways for me. I mean, certainly updating your insurance or getting quotes every year or so is a big one. I was really surprised at how strongly she felt about disability insurance. That was that was a big takeaway for me. And, you know, Jonathan, it's just nice to have experts come on and talk about their field. I think that's useful for us. It's useful for the community. And yeah, I mean, to kind of paraphrase Jennifer, obviously you never hope that you need this insurance, but man, are you glad you have it? So I think that's kind of like the barometer for, do I need this policy? And like I said, during the interview, I might not need my term insurance anymore. I've just kind of dutifully been paying it every single year just on reflex, but maybe that doesn't make any sense. And it, it was always, oh, it's such a tiny amount of money. It's worth it. If, if something terrible happened, Laura would get, you know, X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's only a couple hundred bucks or vice versa. But critically inspecting that and saying, does this make sense anymore? And I think that's what we're advising our audience is really critically inspect the types of insurance you have and most importantly, the types of insurance you need. And Brad, I am not at the point where I can just bail on my term life insurance. In fact, we are having another child this August. It is more important than ever that we have our term life insurance policy absolutely locked down. And I actually did use Policy Genius, and I was able to find a term life insurance policy for myself and my wife. I mean, incredibly affordable. And I tried to play with a few variables, but it looks like depending on your age, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s with no major chronic health conditions and you don't smoke, obviously, if you press smoke, you're just saying, hey, I pay more. Don't smoke. Public service announcement. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you can get a term life insurance policy with up to a $500,000 benefit for over a 20 year period of time. So 20 year term, I mean, it's going to run you in between 20 to $30 a month. It's incredibly affordable. And it's just a, I mean, a nice, easy action step to take. We've actually set up a page on our website where you can compare and contrast these different types of insurance, as well as get yourself a relevant quote for yourself and your family. If you're interested in doing that, just go to chooseify.com slash policy, chooseify.com slash policy, P-O-L-I-C-Y. All right. Unfortunately, that's going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. There's three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book from Vincent Puglisi, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review on either iTunes or Stitcher. And then send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce the winner on the Friday Roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Megan. And she says, I started listening to Brad and Jonathan about a month ago after hearing them on another podcast I love, Her Money by Gene Chatsky. It was one of many fire episodes my personal finance podcast had aired that week, but Brad and Jonathan's passion open-mindedness, and excellent ability to explain complex ideas simply stuck with me. I decided to check out their podcast and have binged it ever since. In only one month, I've upped my side gigs to five times a week, which increased my income by 25%. Decided to buy a townhome so I can house hack, plan on paying off my student debt by 35. I'm 32 now, and will soon after max out all of my retirement accounts. Such a life-changing podcast. I never thought I could accomplish fire with all my student loan debt from degrees I no longer use after a career change at 30. I feel incredibly lucky to have found Choose FI, and I'm so glad Jonathan has a similar story to mine. 
yet he's on the path. So am I, and I'm happy to be here. You guys rock. The fire is burning strong. Yes, I'm so glad I lost that decade with you. (laughs) No, I hear you. There's still hope for us. We've got this. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time. So everyone that's listening to this, really appreciate you hanging around a little bit longer. This little clip is for the grassroots screening tour, which is being organized through a website called Tug. There are tons of screenings scheduled for the month of July, but there's some of these events that are getting very close to their deadline for actually hitting the ticket. Note that this is not actually when the screening is occurring, but you have to reach this minimum threshold that is around 70 tickets in order for the screening to happen. And awareness is really the big piece of this. So we have a platform and we want to make sure that we're using it to support this wherever possible. So since this episode is going live on the 21st of June, I'm basically setting, I'm letting you know where, which screenings are all teed up to happen that have to hit their ticket threshold within the next 10 days or so. Starting with this list, Ammon, Idaho on June 23rd, Rochester, Minnesota, Brookfield, Wisconsin on June 24th, Hollywood and Orlando, Florida on June 30th, Bend, Oregon, Springfield, Missouri, New Brunswick, New Jersey, Fort Collins, Colorado, Baton Rouge, Louisiana on July 2nd. Again, if you hear that and you're like, oh, I'm in the area or I know someone that's in the area that would love this if they knew about it, just send them to chooseify.com slash tug, T-U-G-G. That will redirect them to a landing page where they can find these screenings that are happening in this area. If this is important to you, you want this to happen, then make sure we do our best to spread the word. Go to chooseify.com slash tug, T-U-G-G. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.